my name is Michelle Wright, and these fabulous brothers and sisters up here um, are going to be talking about some specific panel discussions, some things, some topics that uh, we have gathered from different ministries, been talking to some different folks out there, and kind of was able to distill some topics that we wanted to uh, have them share about as to what would be able to be helpful to you in your ministries, things that are able for you to be able to take back to wherever you are and use within your sphere of influence to really continue to build the walls of the singles ministry in our family of churches. So what I'd like to do is start here with Kimba, and what I'm going to ask you all to do is, uh, this will be really informal, um, is take the microphone and pass it down, and uh, it'll kind of meet in the middle. I just pass that down. Um, but if each of you could just give a brief introduction of your names, where you're currently at, how long you've been in our family of churches, when you were baptized, all that good stuff, and what city you're from, uh, so then we all can know who you are. That would be fantastic. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Kimba Henderson. Uh, I've been a disciple for 19 years. Um, I'm very grateful to have been baptized in the same ministry, and I'm still there. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm in the Turning Point Ministry. Oh, uh, my name is Fat Vong. I am uh, from the Greater Baltimore Church of Christ. Uh, I have been a disciple for 15 years, and I've been in Virginia, in Philly, and, and now I'm currently in Baltimore. I've been there for about five years or so. Hey everyone. <laughs> hey everyone, my name is Kamala Amir. I've been a disciple for seven years. I was baptized in the Athens um, campus ministry in, in Athens, Georgia, and now I'm at um, North River in Atlanta, Georgia with the Edge Ministry. Amen. My name is Karen Durst, and I am currently in Phoenix. I have been a disciple for 35 years. Um, I was in uh, Gainesville. Uh, back in the day, and uh, so uh, if you don't know what a soul talk is, we'll hopefully talk about that. Uh -huh. uh, my name is Josh Pullen. I'm in the Jacksonville, Florida ministry. I've been a Christian for 17, 18 years. Uh, I came to this train of churches about five years ago and lead the singles ministry in Jacksonville. All right. Hi, my name is Emily Poppenberg. <laughs> uh, I currently live in Texas. Amen. Nice. Uh, I was converted in the teen ministry, actually in New Mexico, and I currently lead a uh, singles ministry in South Texas. Amen. Hello, everyone. My name is Corandius Moore, and uh, I was in the, li the Gimple's living room. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was, I, was, I was baptized in uh, 1984. I've been a disciple uh, a little over, uh, about 30 years. And uh, I serve in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, in the incredible South Cities region. All right, so as you can see, we have a wealth of information up here. And so this will, again, like I said, be very informal because we want to just be able to share, share with you. So it, it's going to be kind of like you're in our living room. It's just really, really big. Um, and so when you guys, oh, I'll kind of present a topic. If you want to share on that, just feel free to raise your hand and uh, then we'll get the mic to you and then you can share. So the first topic that we've uh, found that has been kind of very much uh, a buzz in a lot of the ministries and they are ministries ranging from eight singles to maybe 180, 250 is converting professionals and how to do that, what that looks like. And again, keeping in mind that it's going to look like in different cities and in, in different ways. But wanted to ask the panel, what are some of the things in your ministries that, uh, that have worked in converting professionals? I'll share on that. Um, I think the Edge Ministry in Atlanta, um, some things that we like, you know, some things that we've done to convert professionals is having services where professionals are. So one thing that we did even like two weeks ago is went out to Piedmont Park, it's a huge park in Atlanta, um, and had a church service, just like with the Edge Ministry, just us. And um, my coworker came, my orthodontist came, like, you know, people from all over. And like, even from that service, there's tons of people studying right now that are all like 
young professionals in the city of Atlanta. So I just, I think just kind of going to where those people are. Um, and one other thing that we did, um, a group of us, um, there's like two or three people working at the same company. So we started having a Bible talk in the morning for breakfast um, at their company. Um, and so people that lived in the area just went over and were there and their coworkers were there. And um, so that was another way. But yeah, I think just going out to, going to where the professionals are, being amongst them, so yeah. Amen. Uh, I know for us, we started having our, it's along the same lines. Uh, we started having our Bible talks actually in areas where professionals meet. Like I, I know for me, I was a teacher before this and uh, I would go to coffee shops to grade. And that's where I would spend my time. So what we've been doing is having our singles Bible talk at a corner bakery cafe. And we go a little early to invite people that are there maybe grading or doing what, hanging out with their other coworkers. And, We've had just people that are professionals just come and join us because they were just there to eat. Mm. And, uh, and it was great. I had another brother, uh, he was sharing his faith, and he was like, yeah, I, I saw you guys there. So now we're coming very uh, visual even in, in that field. So, yeah, that's one thing that's been working for us. Josh. Um, a big thing that I, I look at when sharing with professionals uh, I don't want to get the idea that professionals are this different group of people aside from singles. Like, we're singles, and there's professionals, and then there's the unprofessional singles. <laughs> so I guess this overall concept that if you're a professional, go ahead and be a professional. Yeah. And be a Christian professional. Right. And share your faith. Yep. And you're sharing with professionals. Yep. Right? Are there good ways, good places to go and do that? There are. Yep. Right? But if you want to be a professional, you want a ministry of professionals, well... I guess you can not wear your t-shirt to your Bible talk, yeah, right? So, I mean, if you just want to do that, you can dress more professionally, but not all professionals wear suits and ties either. So professionals, you have blue collar, you have white collar, you have every other collar, you have suit collars, right? So what kind of collar is professional? What are you looking for? You have to be more specific with that. In Atlanta, it may, downtown Atlanta may be different than the outskirts of Atlanta, yep. or Detroit may be different than Jacksonville. So professional... It's, it's up to you, I believe, the body of Christ as he designed it in Corinthians 12 is perfectly made. He made it perfectly. Go be your part of the body greatly. Be you greatly and watch God use you greatly and you'll reach the people like you. Bring them in. Amen. Yeah. yeah, nobody's probably going to want to follow that, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, uh, I think one, one thing to add um, Generally, uh, most of us, uh, regardless of you know where we work, when you're, uh, when, as as we have jobs and they're like professional events, like uh, team outings, things like that, your companies tend to put a lot of money into investing in you and taking care of you, and so it's very different for uh, for you to invite a friend who is used to like company outings that are done really well, and then for them to come to a church outing where there's just a bag of chips, mm. uh, and so talk about it, brother. I think. I think as we, as we mature, uh, regardless of our income, we're, we're looking for things that are nicer. And so we found that as things are done excellently uh, and done really, really, you know, whatever you do, just do it really well, make it really nice. Uh, it, it tends to uh, get people to come out and to, to kind of loosen up and really be able to have great conversation. Uh, it's not always a spiritual event. Sometimes, to me, every event is a spiritual event. You're always looking for an opportunity to talk about God, uh, and you're always trying to break down um, different barriers. But, but making things really nice is a great way to get people to want to come out because uh, they'll come for the food, for the hanging out, and then it's an opportunity and a window for, them to talk, for you to talk about God with them. So. Amen. Amen. All right, one of the next topics that we've heard that uh, a lot of you are curious about is really looking at training up new leaders. Uh, some of the ministries uh, that I've heard, it's, the, you know, your leaders are tired. <laughs> they're, they're ready, but they're looking, you're looking to find new people that you can raise up and capture that dream that you have. So I wanted to pose that to the panel and see, ha have there been some, some interesting ways that you guys have been able to find new leaders and train those new leaders that you found? Kimba. Um, I think, you know, it, it's been very interesting in, in our ministry. Uh, we've uh, recently had a, a, our singles leader who's on staff step down. Um, and so it's really calling all of us to step up more and more and more. And it's, I, th I think God's worked it very well where it's been kind of slow. Uh, we've been kind of seeing this coming. But one of the things that I've seen in our ministry that's really great is we, when we have someone young who has, we believe has the ability to lead, um, we really find an area where they're strong. 
Sometimes it's, you know, counseling people. Sometimes it's leading Bible studies. I think, you know, I've been in the church for a while, and I remember the times where you had to be, like, priest, counselor, you know, a bail bondsman, like, everything. You know, like, there was this very intense pressure to be all uh, for the people in your group. And I think that, that that's why some leaders are tired because they're still doing that. So, you know, we, we've done a thing where, you know, we've got some groups that are extremely fruitful. And so what they're doing is when they have someone around for six months, they start to train them and then they split. And so then it's more of like, you've got this group with a couple of tiers. So it's not one person over this like group of 20, but you've got little pockets and finding ways that people lead because they get their confidence in these areas and then they want more. And so that's worked really well. N no one's overwhelmed and I feel the load is shared. Cool. Carandius. Yes, Carandius from Boston. Um, <laughs> there's a couple. Uh, the Reeds are doing a great job. Uh, they, have the, they have both a men's group and a women's group where they are training uh, us uh, in that group to be able to train some of the people in our ministries. And uh, I think that's awesome. We didn't have that before. I think one of the things I do when I study the Bible with people and I, and I see this guy has a great character, a great heart, you know, I'll challenge him while I'm studying the Bible with him yeah. to dream about being, a, being a, a leader in God's kingdom, to do what I do. And uh, I'll just give him a vision as we're studying the Bible. And uh, we've got a young guy right now named uh, Renzo, Renzo Rojas. Uh, he just is on fire for God. And uh, he's someone that I talked to when I was studying the Bible with him about being a leader in God's kingdom. And uh, something that Angela Perry has done uh, with uh, some of the sisters, some of the women in the kingdom, is uh, she had all the women come together and just kind of ask them, you know, what can, you know, what is it, what do you need from me as a leader, you know, to help you to serve God? And uh, so they shared with her. It was a very challenging time. Amen. But uh, so they shared with her some of the things uh, that they felt uh, about her and about her leadership. But one of the things that was born from that is uh, they created this activity called First Fridays. And uh, so the first Friday of every month, you know, they would have an activity that they would host in, in, in uh, each in different apartments in each other's homes. And each sister would take a term take a time in determining, deciding, you know, what the group was going to do, where it was going to be, and uh, they would organize it and make it happen. And uh, because of that, one of the women that was a part of that, her name is Linda, uh, she's now uh, one of Angela's young disciples who she's raising up to be a leader. So, uh, and that, she, she kind of came from uh, just that idea of First, of first Fridays. So I think just kind of doing things like that, giving people an opportunity to do things, and then you can kind of see their gifts. You know what I'm saying? You kind of see where they're serving, and then you can kind of tap their shoulder and say, hey, I think you'd be great at this. Mm. Emily. Uh, I think for me, I know as women, like, we need encouragement. Like, we don't think we can lead until somebody believes in you. So I think for me, when I see these women that they have good hearts, but they won't speak up. or what, So I think it's important as a leader to tell them, like, I really think you'll be great. And I want to help you. I want to train you. Hey, it's going to take hard work, but I believe in you. And having a lot of those talks, and when you see them do well, tell them, that was awesome. Can you do it again? And I, <laughs> like, that's, and do it more. And then, hey, can you do me a favor? I need you to help me help the other sisters do the same. I'm really glad. This is your gift, and you believe in them, and you tell them you believe in them to the point where you're the example of that. And I think that really helps to build leadership. And then they want to do it. Not they like, oh, I have to lead now. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to do it because it's their gift and they feel like they're important. And, and they are. But I think, uh, I know for me, that's something I, I, I do with my women. Like, I, and I do believe in them. And I, want, and I say that, you know. And um, even if they, fall, they feel like they're falling short, that I, it's no, like, that's totally okay. And I'm going to help you through it. Uh, and I'll be there, be your friend. So I think that's the important part of building leadership is that you, you're not giving up on them and that you're having hope and faith in them. Amen. Absolutely. Karen. One of the things we've done in Phoenix is uh, we became very intentional in our training um, by creating, picking six women um, and then uh, Tamar Grosset, who is uh, my partner in crime, we uh, decided to take every other week uh, and set out a schedule and ask the sisters to commit to those particular six weeks of training. 
And we did things like biblical training, uh, using Douglas Jacoby's book on a, a quick overview of the Bible. Uh, we had them do mock, mock Bible talks where they actually created a Bible talk outline and actually had to do it for the um, group. And we did the whole, some were non-Christians and some were Christians, and that was very, very fun for us anyway. Um, but I think having those intentional times, and then they actually had to memorize scriptures, um, which I think it, we've lost a lot of, all of us. And then we, they had a final at the end where they had to actually, um, you know, it wasn't one of those things where, oh, you failed. But um, it was just the commitment of this is serious. And I think sometimes we lose the intentionality of what we're doing. And we really have to take that opportunity to really train in that way as well. Uh, I know for us uh, with our leaders, sometimes you kind of have a leader figure that it just stands out. You know, they, they're well-spoken and, and whatnot. And I think other times there are leaders that... Um, they, they just don't have the normal qualities that, you, that would stick out as a leader, but you'd be surprised who steps up when, when you give them a chance. Um, so I think I, I, look, I try to look for all of our guys. I try to look at all of them and see in which, which kind of ways we can, uh, we can raise them up and how they can lead in some capacity. So I'm, I'm training everybody to lead, and just depending on what they're able to give, uh, it depends on what, what, what they're leading. Um, so with leadership, it's always going to be a ton of work up front. One of the things I try, we try to do with our leaders is we make sure that we explain, like, hey, this is what I want to do. Uh, this is what I see. Uh, and, and then we kind of have a talk about, we paint a picture of what we're going to do, like how much time we're going to spend together, uh, the difficulties, the challenges. We're really up front. Then we ask people to pray for it. And it sounds very straightforward, very simple. But when you do this, it brings a lot of security so people don't feel like they, they know what they're stepping into. They know what they're praying for. Uh, and, and you can kind of help them uh, see them grow. So we do spend a lot of time with them. Uh, the book... Um, uh, the master plan of evangelism, a great model. You, you're, you're showing people everything. People tend to catch more than they hear. Uh, and so they, they see in you as they spend time with you, and that raises up a, a lot of leadership. And as they go with you, they become even more and more inspired to become greater leaders. Um, the other thing that we find is uh, that that's really help, helpful with uh, uh, our leaders is... Um, All right, no pressure, but I'm going to give you, like, five seconds. <laughs> oh, boy. It's really, really good, though. <laughs> and, like... It is fantastic. It's so fantastic. You guys going to have to talk to me later it about it. secret. <laughs> so, when you see Fod in fellowship, say, the password is... And he's going to tell you what it is. And if you think about it, we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, but I also wanted to see, because there, there are things that, you know, we just want to, uh, to talk about. And the, one of the things that Larry mentioned this morning is a difference in age groups. I mean, even looking here, we've got, you know, singles is defined as you're unmarried. And so it's different than the teen ministry where, you know, you have teen in your number. Or, you know, you're like 13 or 19. That's very simple. But there, there can be a vast dichotomy in ages, anywhere between 20, after you get out of the teen ministry, and all the way up till you go to heaven and meet Jesus. So wanted to ask the panel, uh, seeing as, you know, you are representative, how do you guys handle the multiple age ranges that uh, you see in your singles ministries. Is that problematic? And if it was, how were you able to kind of come to a solution and, and what that looked like? Okay, we're going to go Karen, Kamala, Kimba, all the Ks. <laughs> well, one of the things we started doing in Phoenix, when Floyd and Tamar got there, we started having midweeks together. Um, all the singles came together for midweek service. And at first it was a little challenging because some people didn't want to drive downtown because you have the far reaches of each uh, sector of the city, but um, that has really built some great family, and it's provided opportunities because the things that um, we've done in that time is uh, get to know you kind of things, and I think what that's done is help people see they have a lot more similarities than they do differences, um, and just because, you know, I'm 54 and she's she 20, that doesn't mean we don't have things that we can share that we have in common, and I think, too, just um, helping people realize the need for family um, that a lot of us in the world today, we don't have the kind of families that we wish we did. And when we come into the kingdom, we don't know what to do with that either. And so by uh, having the older disciples uh, mentoring uh, 
we either intentionally or unintentionally, just through fellowship, building those relationships, um, and then doing activities that everybody likes, not just the things geared towards the, sing the young singles or the older singles, but doing things that everybody can participate in and have a good time with has really helped us a lot to bridge that gap and just the expectation that we're not separate, we're together and we're unified. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, I mean, I'm going to piggyback a lot of, of what you said. Um, we, the Edge Ministry in Atlanta, has midweeks together as well, and we even have Sunday services together too sometimes. And I think too, like, um, we just have a mutual respect for each other, you know, just as people, as family. Like, you know, I see like some of the older people like in the Edge Ministry in the crowd right now, and I'm like, I flock to these women. Like, I'm like, hey, can I hang out with you? Can I come to your house? Can I have dinner? Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, we just have a mutual, it's just a mutual respect. Like, we all have something to give. Like, I'm trying to learn from you. Like, you know, there's younger people that I can teach. Like, I think just, you know, having that, that mindset that we can all learn from each other and we can all help each other. And this is a family. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that has really been crucial for our ministry. Like, I don't, I don't feel the you know, a weird separation or anything like that. These are my friends, you know, these are, you know, my, my moms, my, you know, older sisters. And um, yeah, I think just having that mutual respect that we can all give to each other. Mm -hmm. so. um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I, I think in our ministry, you know, it's, we've been on this thing. Our, our evangelist has been on this uh, campaign, so to speak, for many years. Um, that's very exciting. Uh, we don't have a campus ministry, so we have to very intentionally pursue millennials, um, you know, between the, 18, the years of 18 and 30. So we actually have a separate ministry that's focused on converting uh, people within that age group. Now, we do have our midweeks together, um, but we have separate, you know, we're all together in one, in one building, but we, we focus on different things. And I think that came from, we just learned that sometimes having our midweeks together, we had a kind of this, this thing called um, the Bible for Dummies, which was this very deep kind of theological, very intense kind of study. And a lot of our millennials were like, am I back in college? Get me out of here. You know, they wanted to like run. And then you have people in their 20s, 30s, 40s been around that are like, this is food for my soul. So I think it's discovering the needs are different. And so trying to figure out that balance of where do you separate to strengthen the needs that are specific and where you come together and really grow and learn and build each other up. Um, I'm really proud of the women um, in our ministry, especially that are, you know, in their 60s and 70s. I mean, they, they, do, they do things like, you know, they'll have a new Christian breakfast. They have teas. They really are, are doing, they're, they're Titus three women. I mean, they're Titus three women. They're really going after building up and, and teaching, um, you know, the women and, you know, encouraging us and building us up. You know, they go on cruises together. We're like, where'd they all go? They're like in the Caribbean, you know. And so, uh, which is exciting. You know, I love that. They're living their life and they, they, they are very present in the singles. They are not on the sidelines. They're very present. So I think it's making sure that everyone knows that they are needed and being very specific and intentional about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I think the other thing kind of touching on what Kimba said is somebody, there's always somebody who's younger than you mm -hmm. that you can teach and being <laughs> Titus two and Titus three, like there's always somebody that you can show and you can teach and that will help build your ministries. Yeah. Um, one of the other things, which is a very big thing, uh, is the male to female ratio yeah. in some of the singles ministries. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and address the elephant in the room. If you, because, you know, we're in the living room. It's just a little big, but we're going to talk about the big pink elephant in the living room. And, um, and how, that, how you all deal with that, address that, work with that. Has it been overcome? What, it, what does it look like in, in ministries? Carandius and then Karen. Okay. Okay, let me see here. <laughs> um, I, think, um, I think Larry has done a great job uh, with the whole Boston, uh, Boston Singles in terms of just having a ministry that's growing. You know, if we have a ministry that's growing, uh, men are going to come. We're going to reach out to men. And one thing that I've seen that's happened in the downtown region is that as Larry has focused in on strengthening the brothers, encouraging them and raising up young leaders, uh, more men have been attracted to that ministry. 
And uh, one of the things that I do in the Southern Cities region is, you know, I'll, I'll ask the marrieds to uh, invite their coworkers that are single, the men, to invite their family members that are single. And uh, I'll ask them to bring them. And uh, when they come to church, I want to meet them, and I want to, of course, study the Bible with them. But also, I believe that Sunday morning worship service is a great fishing hole because people will bring their friend, their visitors to church, and uh, sometimes I don't even know that there are singles that are visiting there. And uh, I'll just happen to hear people talking and, and talking to this guy, and I find out that he's single. And so I jump right in there. So I keep my eyes open during our Sunday morning worship service for the, the singles that are there in the group. And I make sure that I meet them. And we've studied the Bible with quite a few people that have come where nobody in the singles met those men. And uh, so I would advise, hey, just keep your eyes open. Sunday morning is a great fishing hole. Can I talk to the sisters a minute? I know. I've been around a long time. We complain a lot sometimes. Um, but I want to challenge you. Instead of complaining, pray. Because that's what's really changed Phoenix. When we started praying, God really moved. Our downtown ministry had one man and four women, and we now have 12 men and 10 women. So... God moves, and it may not just be with conversions. It could be moving people in. It could be people getting restored. There's lots of ways God will move, but we have to be willing to put the effort into really praying that God's going to do it and um, just really praying for the people around us. Instead of complaining and whining, get out there and do something about it and not just sit back and complain. Yeah. Cool. Kimba and then Kamala. Sure. Kimba and then Kamala. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> yes, take advice from us. We don't understand microphones. Okay. Um, you know, I think, it, I feel like I've been, I've been very blessed. I've always been in a ministry that's uh, been pretty even or close to it. Um, and I think that's just been a gift from God, I think. But, but recently, we definitely have been, um, a lot of my girlfriends, they call it the Save the Males campaign. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, you know, we definitely, as, as sisters, take an active part in saving the males because you ask a lot of brothers how they got here, and a lot of times there's a woman involved. Woman or food. So, um, <laughs> so you, know, <laughs> you know, we feel very, I feel very much like this is, you know, just as much something that I can, that we can be a part of. And so, you know, I think I think we have to be careful, and this is probably a bigger issue of feminizing the church mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. much to where it's not attractive to men. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and so I think even some of the things that we do and some of the things that we talk about in our Bible talks, um, you know, I mean, I know it sounds weird, but if there's men, women will come. So it doesn't even matter. We're like, I don't know what they're talking about, but there's men here, so I'll be here. Um, but, you know, I went to a lucha wrestling t show the other day because one of the brothers in, in my Bible talk you know, works for a TV show, and it's a bunch of, re it's wrestling, like it's like with masks, it's this like Mexican cultural wrestling thing, and I went there, and I'm like, this is awesome, you know what I mean, and, but we had about, I think there was about, you know, eight guys that came to that, and that was just an outing, and that was an opportunity for us to get to know these guys, mm -hmm. and these are, these are guys I've never seen before, so, you know, sometimes we go play pool, sometimes we go play basketball, I think you know, as sisters specifically, it's, you know, being in these, in these situations where we're, we'll, we'll, meet, we'll meet men in a very safe kind of situation and invite them to church. And a lot of times they come. And so I think we are with our brothers in trying to turn this around. Amen. Um, and, and we're praying, of course, as well. And so, you know, recently it's been like we've been baptizing a lot of men and I'm kind of like, I better start, you know, looking for some women because, you know, we're going to have the problem they have in China, which is they have 20 more mil million men than women. But, you know, amen. Move to <laughs> amen. So, Not everybody needs to move to China. <laughs> Mission trip. <laughs> Kamala. <laughs> Um, just along the same lines, like, um, some of my friends and I have been doing this, like, evangelism 2014. Um, and, yeah, I mean, just really quickly, when guys in the world, like, and sisters know, like, when guys, guys are always trying to holla, like, all the time. So, 
I'm like, if you have the boldness to come and ask me for my number, I'm going to, hey, you want to come to, I'm actually, I'm not going to give you my number, but I'm headed to a small group if you want to join me. Like, do you want to, let's do that. Or guys, I'm, I like, you know, I'm trying to get involved in the community with like kickball leagues or whatever, just like getting out and, you know, not only for men, but just meeting people. But yeah, Mangelism 2014. Cool. Yeah. Josh. Um, she made a great point. Sometimes, I mean, guys, they, they like girls, right? It's not... <laughs> It's not a bad thing. God designed it that way. He made women for men to like them and the opposite way around. Um, the great way for, to, to get men is for the men to, to reach out, right? Because we can blame women a lot, and they could suffocate. A new man comes into the, to the fellowship, right? <laughs> Whoa, he's here. Get him in leadership, quick. And we can do that. Uh, but a very easy way to do that is just to invite him into your life. Because you're not going to make disciples by saying, all right, let's do the studies. Oh, he likes you, great. I'll study with him, do the studies, and then good luck. And just feed him to the wolves, right? Invite him into your lives. So a, a bunch of what, what I do and what I try and do in Jacksonville is we have a sports ministry. So I love sports. I play sports. Men love sports. So they like playing sports, right? They like being macho, testosterone. We do that. So we have a sports ministry at the church. We have a very large church. So we do basketball on Thursday. We have volleyball on Monday. We have football on Saturdays. So when someone comes and hollers, <laughs> right? Not my term. When they come and do that, she can say, hey, well, why don't you get with Josh and go study? And he can be like, study what? Or she can be like, hey, I know this guy named Josh. Do you like playing sports? And it's a very easy way not to trick people into Jesus because we don't need to do that. It's a way to invite them into your life because it's a walk. If you're really inviting them into a family, look at it as you're inviting them into a family mm -hmm. and share life with them. So I see them. I want to play sports with you. You like her? You have to get through me first. Amen. <laughs> but welcome to the family. Let's go play some football. And men, men we have to do that. We have to break out of our, the things we like doing every week, our schedule. The schedule is the hardest thing to get, into, to get into. A church is not growing sometimes because we don't want to break our, our tradition, our schedule. So break your schedule up and let these people into your lives and you'll start to grow. Acts 3, 4, 2, they, they loved each other. Their lives were each other's lives. Their things were each other's things. And they grew daily. Amen. Open up your life. Amen. Amen. And I will go ahead and make the disclaimer... I don't think he was calling the women wolves. No. <laughs> what she said. I'm just trying to help my brother out. So, I got you. Um, I just wanted to put that out there. So, we've got one more topic that we can hit very, very quickly. Um, and that is any kind of, and we've mentioned a couple here, but just to kind of give you some bullet points. And panel, if you can make it um, short and sweet, that would be most awesome. Uh, any of the new or out of the out of the box ideas that have helped you build your ministry? We, you know, you heard about sports and all that things, but things that you know aren't just your average. Okay, we're going to do this because we've always done this. But things that that your ministry has come up with that have helped bring people into your ministry. I'll Emily. share one real quick. The the new thing with a lot of the women is Pinterest. So having a Pinterest party is a lot of fun, bringing your friends and your coworkers. So that's a cool idea. That is cool. Cool. Okay. One of the things we've done um, in downtown Phoenix is we have a, lot, a large homeless population, and there are a lot of people that like to do service things. So um, we have uh, done... Uh, Get, get our Bible talk together and we make bags for the homeless and then we go out and in groups and uh, give the bags out and that's just been very uh, union, uh, unity building and also it's helped other people want to come because you'll find people that want to do those kind of things versus come to a Bible talk or things like that so that's uh, been a way that it's helped our hearts too because it gets us out there giving to people that we normally wouldn't. Yeah. Amen. Kimba. Um, I think a couple things have been very exciting to watch. Uh, one of the things that 
I've definitely seen the fruits of was a few years ago, um, as I mentioned, our evangelist is very focused on converting uh, millennials specifically as well in the, in the singles. Um, and so we actually had a mission team that was comprised of singles and marrieds where that was a focus. So about, you know, we had about maybe 80 people that specifically focused on, um, you know, finding and converting people of that age group. And we basically went from having, I don't know, maybe 10 to 12. I think we have about 45 or 50 now um, because that's a very specific thing. And it was great because we had mature married people involved in this. Um, and you've got these young people looking at these these guys with families and going, wow, that's, they, they, they see something that, you know, in the future they'll want. So I think working together as a ministry to convert people is, was really great. That was a really exciting time. And something that we've done recently that's been very exciting for me is, you know, we started to realize it take, it's been taking us a long time to, to convert people and it's why and it's schedule. It's, we have all these ministries, we have this and we have that and we have this and we got to go here. Like, you know, I'm thinking, uh, and we're thinking like, wow, okay, how's Wednesday? And you're like, what about the days when you're like, I have like three studies in one day. Like, what happened to that? And I feel our schedules have creeped in. So we just started something recently that's been great. And it's, it's uh, make a friend in fall, in, for the fall. And so we've, we've stopped having our midweeks for six weeks. You know, we're like, no one's going to fall away in six weeks because we don't have midweek. The need is to have more time so we can be focused and, uh, you know, go reach out and make friends and convert people. So that's one of the things we've been doing recently. Yeah, that is new and out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Uh, a couple of things. Um, I think one of the things in Boston is that, uh, to kind of piggyback off some of the stuff shared already, is uh, making sure that we have fun activities, but have, make those ch uh, activities church-wide. You know, uh, like I can pull my group and say, hey, let's do something fun. But as a, as a Boston ministry, really planning something fun for all the singles to come and be a part of. You'd be amazed at how many visitors people will bring when they're coming to something fun. Uh, we've had boat cruises. I mean, we've had uh, picnics in the park. We've had uh, 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 blue man group nights. I mean, just all kinds of activities where, you know, people, where the singles can invite their friends to come and be a part of. And I think uh, that's, that's just opened the door for a lot of visitors to be able to come and uh, worship with us. We've had services, uh, Sunday services, at our church, single services in the outdoors, where we've had a picnic. We've started out with a, a, a communion service, and, uh, and it led into a picnic, uh, to a little uh, wacky sports competition, where uh, we're just, there was people just having fun all over the place. And people are excited. Disciples are excited about that. They want to invite their friends to things that are fun, to things where they're going to be able to have a great time. Amen. Amen. Well, we are coming to, uh, I, I did have my timer on, so I was conscious of the time. Um, there are multiple other things that we had um, as, as topics that this panel is very, very adept to. I encourage you, when you see these folks in fellowship, to go up and ask them, hey, how did you guys do that? What about single parents? How do you guys handle, uh, handle single parents in your ministry? What about if you're single again? Do you do that uh, a specific ministry for widows or widowers or people who've gone through divorce? How does that work? How, have you guys been able to raise the profile of your singles ministry within your church? Because there are other times and there are other churches where the singles ministry is a, has a very, very low profile. And that is not helpful. But these, these folks can help you with that and can offer suggestions of what they and their ministries have done to, to help address any of those situations. So again, I'd love for you all to give a, a, just a warm thank you to this panel. I'd like to thank you guys. Um, for taking your time out and preparing and really sharing what has worked in your ministries with all of us so we can take it back and start this revolution of rebuilding the wall and really seeing the singles be the tip of the spear for God. And 